A showdown between Jordan Peterson and Destiny reminds us why we love the internet, why we love video streaming platforms like this one, and why we're so grateful that we've got Jordan Peterson on our side. We're going to break down this exchange and this interview extensively coming up in a moment, and you're going to love it. Also, Karine Jean-Pierre really doesn't like it when you ask uncomfortable questions like, does Joe Biden have dementia? Wait till you see how she raged against a radio host for asking that. Oh, and Caitlin Collins on CNN. Boy, is she in over her head when she tried to challenge some experts on the so-called abortion pill. It didn't end well for Caitlin Collins, and we'll show you all the ugly aftermath coming up right now. We're, we're brought to you by the Electronic Payments Coalition. I'm Larry O'Connor, and you can call me Larry. We're streaming live at Rumble right now. We sure are. And if you want to join us uh, there anytime, it's noon, usually, when we go live at Rumble. You can interact. You can leave your comments. Like and subscribe, though, this show, wherever you're watching it right now. We have been astounded by the growth just over the last three weeks. We're really taking off, and we love it. And it's because you're liking, subscribing, commenting. You know how these things work. And uh, if you like the audio-only podcast, or if you miss a show because you're not able to watch the video, you can subscribe to that, too, at Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And honestly, even if you don't listen to the Apple Podcast or the audio podcast, go ahead and subscribe anyway, because it really helps us out. We're not asking for money. We're just asking for you to subscribe and like the podcast. Oh, and one other thing. Make sure you check out all of our town hall sites, townhall.com, hotair.com, pjmedia.com, redstate.com, twitchy.com, bearingarms.com. We've got some pretty great sites, and the show's available there as well. All right, let's get right to it. Daily Wire. They've got some pretty phenomenal hosts over there, including Jordan Peterson, and he had a showdown uh, with Destiny. Now, if you don't know who Destiny is, uh, he is a liberal, he is a Marxist, he is a leftist, and he allows his Marxism to filter into every aspect of his political beliefs, whether it's economic, whether it's social, whether it's cultural, whether it affects his views on religion and marriage and childbearing, all of it. He's quintessentially liberal. He's a YouTuber. Uh, but I got to give him this. He engages with us. He engages with conservatives. He's not like Chuck Todd, who like, well, I, we shouldn't be giving people like this a platform. We shouldn't give them the dignity of having their opinions heard. No, actually, Destiny will go into the lion's den. He's recently debated. Um, he's uh, debated uh, 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 Trent Horn, a Catholic YouTuber on uh, abortion and on uh, so-called reproductive rights. He's engaged. Oh, he's got a great episode of the Tim cast with Tim Pool with John Doyle and Lauren Chen. With that is really worth watching. It's about eight months old. I think he recently had a back and forth with uh, Candace Owens as well, I think. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. And now here he is with Jordan Peterson. So I want I want to hand it to him for that. I also want to hand it to him for the fact that he doesn't have blue hair anymore. For a while there they had blue hair. Blue hair is a red flag. It tells you a lot about people with it, especially if it's a man who decides to go with the blue hair thing. Maybe he's growing up. Maybe he's maturing. Maybe he's having a different outlook on his opinions on things. You know, he famously proclaimed to the world that he was in an open relationship with his wife. He and his wife had an open relationship, and this is the way everybody should do it. It's a great thing. It's really healthy. It's wonderful for us. Have an open relationship with your wife. About two months ago, it was announced that his wife is leaving him for another man. And so the open relationship has now been closed forever. And I... Don't want to make fun of him for that. That's terrible. Broken up marriage is a bad thing. Maybe, maybe sticking with a traditional committed monogamous relationship is the way to go. Just a thought. He and Jordan Peterson started engaging on climate change. And I want you to watch something here. It's really important. I'm going to let this play through. But it begins with Destiny trying to just to just force a stipulated given on the conversation. But it's undeniable that the climate has affected our planet. And watch how brilliantly Jordan Peterson takes that and then changes the entire debate in his favor. Watch. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, just I don't think know that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature uh, 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 detection sites 
were first put outside urban areas and then as and then right and then you have everyone. to correct then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas and then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure this isn't data this is guess and there's something weird underneath it there's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it it has this guise of compassion oh we're going to save the poor in the future it's like that's what the bloody communists said and they killed a lot of people doing it and we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that you know we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now and if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now well that's a small price to pay for the future utopia and we've heard that sort of thing before and the alternative to that is for is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti dystopian future and that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. And if this wasn't immediately impacting the poor in a devastating manner, I wouldn't care about it that much, but it is. You know, I watched over the course of the last five years, the estimates of the number of people who were in serious danger of food privation rise from about 100 million to about 350 million. That's a major price to pay for a little bit of what, what would you say for for progress on the climate front that's so narrow it can't even be measured. I don't think the increase in, in hungry people on the in the planet is because of climate policies. Why not? Think, because, because I don't think that countries in Africa are being pushed away from fossil fuels. I think most developing countries. Of course they are. are. They can't even get they can't even get loans from the World Bank to produce for, per, pursue fossil fuel development. And there's plenty of African leaders who are screeching at the top of their lungs about that because the elites in the West have decided that, well, it was okay for us to use fossil fuel for, so that we wouldn't have to starve to death and our children had some opportunities. But maybe the starving masses that are too large a load for the world anyways shouldn't have that opportunity. And that's, that's direct policy from the UN fostered by organizations like the w, WEF. They're going to have to turn to renewables. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Yeah, good luck with that with renewables. In Western Europe, they can't do it. In America and Canada, they can't do it. Except all of you people in sub-Saharan Africa, we're going to force that on you and other third world nations. He's 100% right here. Uh, it's the elitists in the West who have been able to develop our civilization and our economy utilizing fossil fuels and oil and gas and petroleum and electricity from coal and other areas who are now forcing third world nations, underdeveloped nations who haven't had the advantage of the economic growth that the West has had, now telling them that they can't do basic things to try to bring themselves up out of global poverty. Why would that be? Uh, you don't believe me? Go ahead and Google the controversy over burning dung in Africa. You know, in Africa, you're poor, you're living in a hut, you're starving, you're cold at night, you want to cook food, you want to you want to distill your water so that it kills the bacteria so you don't have dysentery, but you don't have anything to burn, right? But there's a lot of poop lying around because you got a lot of animals, big pieces of it. You got elephant poop and it burns. And so that's what they did until the environmentalist wackos came in and tried to stop them from doing it because you burn all that dung and you release methane into the air and that's going to hurt the planet. And what will I tell my friends at the Hamptons? when I'm drinking Chardonnay about what I did to try to stop global warming. Well, I made sure that those Africans living in squalor couldn't keep themselves warm at night. That's what I did. That's the kind of mentality that has been used here. And by the way, when Jordan Peterson makes the point that this is all Marxism, this is all communism, they sold us this back under Stalin. Oh, sure, we're going to feel a little pain right now. You got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. But eventually we'll have all the perfection of our utopia and everyone will be happy. How many people starved in Mao's China, in Stalin's Soviet Union with that lie? And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Exactly. You don't believe me? You go back and look at the historical record of what the environmental wacko activists wanted in the 60s and in the 70s with the population, Bob, oh, overpopulation is going to kill the planet. And all of the drilling of oil is going to kill the planet. And all of the refining of oil into gas is going to kill the planet. And we've got dirty air and we've got dirty water and we've got to do something about it. We've got to get rid of all the pollutants and everything. Every single thing that they wanted back then to achieve their goals, from ending drilling and exploration of oil, 
to uh, to major manufacturing ability to to burning coal to um, families having large large families with many many children you can't have that because of overpopulation to eating meat by the way or eating any kind of animal for that matter right all of the things they want us to do now don't use your air conditioner don't go on planes don't travel just ride a bike just walk just go where the trains can take you but god forbid you get in the car and have a freedom to go where you want to go no you've got to go where the rail line will take you and that's it all of those things that they're demanding on you right now they wanted 50 years ago well before al gore stood up there and discovered global warming that they now call climate change that's the inconvenient truth they went from actually identifying pollutants in the air that we as a nation and a culture actually did something about it. Yeah, it is dirty air. And yeah, we can see objectively speaking that there are particles in the air and pollutants that make you sick. So, okay, we'll do something about that. And now we have clean air and now we have clean water, objectively speaking, but they've lost their power and they've lost their control. So what have they done? They've redefined what a pollutant is. Dirty air is no longer a bunch of pollutants and particles. Dirty air is now defined by having carbon dioxide in it. Carbon dioxide is now a pollutant. Do you know what carbon dioxide is? I'm going to show you carbon dioxide. Here it is. You produce carbon dioxide. And now they've decided that it's a pollutant. And it's so insidious because it's invisible. And so they've just decided that anything that's producing carbon dioxide must be stopped and limited. And yes, that means you, human being, you've got to stop breathing or we've got to stop producing so many of you. It's all the same agenda. They're now doing it under the guise of carbon dioxide. And thank you, Jordan Peterson, for not only calling him on this, but refusing to accept this premise because this is what they do, whether it's in a college dorm room discussion or in a university classroom or whether it's in the production meeting at MSNBC. They'll just all say to each other, well, it's undeniable that the climate is affecting the planet. And there's no one in the room like Jordan Peterson to say, wait a second, why are we accepting that premise? How do you know it's undeniable? How did you reach that conclusion? Nope. The conclusion has been reached. The science has been settled. We're going to have the discussion from this point forward. And we say, no, we got to roll back the tape a bit. And that's what Jordan Peterson just did. Never accept the premise. Now, he invoked communism. He invoked the Soviet Union. He invoked all of the death and destruction that was promised to Western civilization in the 20th century, if we would just uh, buy into the fact that all of the brilliant authoritarian intellectuals who are much smarter and better than us could control our economy and control our procreation, one-child policy in China, just, just cede control to those people and we promise the utopia will deliver. And then he went where most people are not supposed to go when you're debating an idea he invoked Hitler and the Nazis. You know, it's an old axiom when you're debating an issue that if you invoke Hitler to make a point against your opponent, you've lost the debate. And usually that's true. But in this case, well, I'll let you decide. So, you know, Hitler's cover story was that he wanted to make the glorious Third Reich and elevate the Germans to the highest possible status for the longest possible period of time. OK, but that wasn't the outcome. The outcome was that Hitler shot himself through the head after he married his wife, who died from poison the same day, in a bunker underneath Berlin while Europe was in flames, while he was insisting that the Germans deserved exactly what they got because they weren't the noble people he thought they were. And then you might say, well, Hitler's plans collapsed in flames, and wasn't that a catastrophe? Or you could say that was exactly what he was aiming for from the beginning, because he was brutally resentful and miserable right from the time he was, you know, a rejected artist at the age of 16. And so he was working or something was working within him and something that might well be regarded as demonic, whose end goal was precisely what it attained, which was the devastation of hundreds of millions of people and Europe left in a smoking ruin. And the cover story was the Grand Third Reich. 
And so there's no reason at all to assume that we're not in exactly the same situation right now. I think there's a great reason to assume. I think that Hitler's motives and everything that he was trying to do wasn't a secret. I, like, I don't think that anybody had to guess that he was incredibly anti-Semitic, that his secret, Aryan supremacy secret, was going to lead to the destruction and the murder of like so many different people in concentration. Camps. Like, None of this was a secret. It's not like he was hiding it. Um, he hid some extent, I mean, like, he, well, he tried to all, maybe hide the death camps, but nobody in Germany was wondering, like, wow, crazy that pogroms are happening as Jewish people. That's so crazy. Or, wow, they're all being shipped to just mainly the Jews to camps to work like that's kind of interesting or wow he talks about this a lot in Mein Kampf but maybe it's just a coincidence uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change the worry that I Why have here not? is because if we're applying this people thought hit people in Germany thought Hitler was perfectly motivated by the highest of benevolent uh, if, I would, if I were to take this standard of evidence and apply this lens of analysis, couldn't I say the exact same thing about the conservative constellation of belief? They don't want to intervene anywhere in the world because they don't care about the problems there. Uh, they're anti-immigration because they hate brown people. Trump wanted to ban Muslims from coming to the United States because he's xenophobic. Uh, conservatives uh, don't want to have taxes to help the poor because they want homeless people to starve and, and die in the winter. Uh, like I feel like if I... Some if of that... That's exactly what they do, isn't it? Oh, imagine if I took that standard of evidence and applied it to conservative or every single thing he just said about conservative arguments is exactly what not just a youtuber like destiny does but news anchors and moderators of presidential debates and the president of the united states and his democratic party that's exactly what they do to us falsely but it's exactly what they do also i do like the fact that you know his um his his rhetorical description of conservatives intervening around the world. I could say that conservatives don't want to intervene around the world because they're isolationists and they don't care about anyone else. 10 years ago, they would say about, well, I would say that conservatives want to start these wars all around the world because they're trying to push their, their empire of, of American ideas everywhere. It's amazing how quickly the, the knock on conservatives is that we don't want to engage in places like Ukraine, when 10 years ago, the knockout conservatives was we wanted to engage too much. In other words, whatever our position is, they're going to demonize it. Could I just watch this one moment one more time, though? Because this if this isn't a meme already out there, you people are falling down on the job. Uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change. The worry that I Why have not? here is... I need that. I need that as my ringtone. Why not? I want to start talking like Jordan Peterson just because I might start incorporating bloody into my arguments much more. Would it would that would people catch on, do you think, if I did that? I want to do that. All right. Another incredibly revealing moment from Destiny, where uh this is a great see again, this is why they don't want even Ronna McDaniel to be on NBC News, let alone, you know me or Kurt Schlichter or somebody else who could actually effectively debate these issues because they're so not used to being challenged, right? As you just saw, Jordan Peterson, you know, it's an undeniable premise that we have to accept that the climate has affected the earth. No, I won't accept it. And here's why. And now we've got 10 minutes that he can't defend destiny. And then he makes his other argument. He tries to make this big gotcha moment where he says, you know, well, if conservatives were really suspicious of big pharma and big government and all these things, then why aren't they more suspicious of the Catholic Church? Because that's pretty big and that's the same thing. Watch how that ends. That's another thing where I'm not sure if people actually care about gigantism or if they're using it as a proxy for other things that they don't like. Like, I could totally imagine- a Well, person. I care about it. Sure, yeah, you might. Yeah, sorry, I, it just that's in okay. general. That's yeah. okay. Um, because like I could imagine somebody saying that like they don't trust like a large government, they think there's too much uh, you know, prone to tyranny or something like that, but also be supportive of an institution like the Catholic Church, which is literally you know one guy who is a direct right, line. But to they God. can't tax. Um, well, I mean, there's, and they don't have a military. That and is, they can't conscript you. True. Right? Yeah, and they can't throw you in jail. That is true. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Kids always think through your analogy before you voice it because you might run into a buzzsaw called Jordan Peterson. All right, a big chunk of this conversation turned to uh, the COVID shots. I won't call it a COVID vaccine because a big part of this discussion even had to do with the definition of what a vaccine was. And you know, as this discussion goes forward, I want you, as you're watching it, regardless of where you fall, because I, I don't know if I'm completely a thousand percent anti-vaccine, 
And I'm certainly not, I know for a fact that I'm not a thousand percent for the vaccine. And I'm certainly 100% against vaccine mandates. And I can tell you in full disclosure, I had the first two shots because, well, I had to for various reasons, like so many other millions of Americans, I had to get the first two shots. When I mean the first two shots, I got the, the first dosage, which was two shots, right? Uh, like so many millions of Americans, I had to do it to keep my job, all right? Um, and I also needed it to travel internationally. But I have not had a booster at all in any way whatsoever. And I have never had COVID. I, after I got the shot, I got COVID, ironically. And I have not had another booster and I haven't gotten it since. But by the way, don't take any medical advice from me because I'm a, I'm a talking head TV show and radio show host, okay? If you get, get medical advice from a doctor, if you get medical advice from a radio host, you're going to die, all right? So regardless of where you fall on this discussion about the shots, What's most important about it is this discussion isn't allowed to be had. This only happened because it was in the Daily Wire platform. This discussion you're about to see has never been had in Congress. It's never been had on network television or cable television. And that is a crime, a thought crime, literally a thought crime. Watch. But the other obviously glaring possibility is that injecting billions of people with a vaccine that was not tested by any stretch of the imagination with the thoroughness that it should have before it was forced upon people also might be a contributing factor. Partly we, because we know that it led to a rise in myocarditis among young men. And we also know that there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to ever recommend that that vaccine was delivered to young children. So whose there, risk of death at COVID was so close to zero that it might as well have been not, zero. When you're talking about a disease, the risk of death isn't the only thing that you worry about for the disease. Also so you're going to talk about transmission? We, well, because we're, that we're was another about, thing that the we can talk COVID about vaccine pushed. Yeah, can, but it didn't do anything we to can transmission. Talk, it absolutely did because it decreased your chance of getting infected. It didn't destroy, it didn't get rid of transmission, but it reduced transmission. Yeah, but it was your claimed that it would get rid of only transmission. Only if you take one reading of one single quote, I think that oh, Biden said one time where he said, no, come on, Biden one time on the news says, if you get the vaccine, you won't that transfer the so disease, silly. which was it. No. Do you know that our prime minister in Canada deprived Canadians of the right to travel for six months because the unvaccinated were going to transmit COVID with more likelihood than the, than the vaccinated? So this wasn't one bloody statement. This I, was no, like no, hold on. thorough I, what government I, what policy I'm, What I'm saying country. is there wasn't a statement given that if you get vaccinated, there is a 0% chance of transmitting the disease. The idea is that vaccines were supposed to help because Fine. it well, reduces, it reduces we, your hospitalization, yeah. reduces death, and it reduces transmission, hopefully by making it so that people don't get sick or don't get sick for as long. All three of those things, the vaccines did exceedingly well. They, um, they were well, tested. The myocarditis rates are like seven out of 100,000 injections. And the myocarditis is generally acute. And it's generally not as bad as even getting the coronavirus itself, which will lead you also to having myocarditis. It's a much worse severe. side effect than side effects that have caused other vaccines to be taken off the market before. That, so, a but seven it, out of 100,000 rate of acute myocarditis or pericarditis is not a worse uh, side effect than any other vaccine. I think that is a completely acceptable, given that the disease itself is more likely to cause myocarditis or pericarditis. Yes, I don't totally think the data suggests to support that presupposition anymore. The latest peer-reviewed studies show that that's simply not true, especially among young men. I told you at the beginning of this conversation that the progressive leftists were on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's not about being on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's about really one. Really, yeah. yeah well, about, I like, see. So what I see, uh, what I see as the unholy part of that alliance with the pharmaceutical companies is that it dovetails with the radical utopians' willingness to use power to impose their utopian vision. Well, then what do you because make otherwise, of the fact how that would you explain it? Because the leftists should have been the ones that were most skeptical about the bloody pharmaceutical companies. And they jumped on the vaccine bandwagon in exactly the same way that you're doing right Pharmaceutical now. Pharmaceutical companies have helped us tremendously. Yeah, throughout the right. Day. There we go. Fine. No, you think modern I don't medicine think hasn't? so. No, I don't think that so. You're just wrong. I think they're you're utterly wrong. I see. So you don't think that the pharmaceutical companies who dominate the advertising landscape with 75% of the funding are corrupt? I don't. Corrupt is a corrupt. very broad. No, no, no. no, no it's. Do you, think that, do you think that pharmacy, corrupt do you think with they, a tinge of malevolence, you think willing that, to extract money out of people by putting their health on the line? Do you, you don't think believe that, we, that? Do you think that we get effective drugs from pharmaceutical companies? Not particularly. 
I got to tell you, I, I let this exchange go on for quite some time for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is just because it's so good and it's so important and I don't want to interrupt it. But the second was I had to find something, you know, destiny, the lies that the left uh, permits themselves to say uh, for the purpose of their agenda, especially when it comes to all of the protocols that have been put forth for the pandemic and especially the vaccine. It's so insidious, it's so deceptive, and it's so malevolent because we've never had a conversation, first of all, about the vaccines like you just saw, number one. But number two, we've never actually been able to uncover everything that happened and all the lies we were told during the pandemic. And no one has paid a price. No, well, actually, that's not true. We had to pay the price. But the people who made the decisions haven't paid a price. Freaking Gavin Newsom won re-election. We paid the price. Our children paid the price, not being able to go to school. How many, how many here, I bet you every single person watching right now has someone in their life who died during the pandemic and they were not able to go to a proper funeral. They were not able to go to their hospital side and see them as they were dying in a hospital. People died alone because of this. And destiny dares to say, you know, we were, I, Jordan Peterson, they told us this would stop transmission of the disease and they lied to us. Oh, the one thing that Biden said that was taken out of context, really? So uh, that's the other reason why I let it go a little bit, because I had to find this moment. This is the transcript of Anthony Fauci on Face the Nation with John Dickerson. If a person's deciding whether or not to get vaccinated, they have to keep in mind whether it's going to keep them healthy. But based on these new findings, Dickerson asks, um, it would suggest they also have an opportunity if vaccinated to knock off or block their ability to transmit it to other people. It's exactly what they're saying. Remember how Destiny just said, oh, there was one thing that Joe Biden said, but it was never, they never made the case that the vaccine would stop transmission. They never said that. They just said it would reduce the symptoms once you got it. They're lying. And this has become, this has become textbook for them, right? To just deny what was said. Here's Anthony Fauci. You know, John, you said it very well. I could have said, couldn't have said it better. It's absolutely the case, and that's the reason why we say when you get vaccinated, you not only protect your own health, but that of the family, but also you contribute to the community health by preventing the spread of the virus throughout the community. In other words, you become a dead end to the virus. Now, if that isn't telling the American people that you're just being selfish, you're being selfish if you don't get the shot. You need to get the shot for your patriotic duty. You need to get the shot, not for you and your own selfish concerns, but because you need to be a dead end to this virus so that it doesn't spread throughout the community anymore. That is 100% what they told us. And the date of this is May 16th, 2021. That's exactly what they just said. And you can see Destiny personifying the left, personifying Joe Biden, personifying the Democrats, rewriting history. No one ever said that. No one ever said that. Anthony freaking Fauci said it. All right. Another really important moment here, by the way, in this vaccine debate that the two of them had. Do you so do you think that any vaccines work? Yes. Do you think that any I don't think 80 of them work at once for babies? I, I think that's a little risky. But, but yet we've been on this vaccine schedule for how many decades? Like and this, don't... like this, not like this, not carefully. I had a ton of vaccines when I was a child. I'm pretty sure that was the norm for people. There were a ton of vaccines. There's to way into. more now. Okay. And you think well, that- Well, you can understand why. I mean, look, part of it, no doubt, no doubt part of it is a consequence of the genuine genuine willingness to protect children. But the moral hazard is quite clear. And people on the left used to be aware of this. What you do you make of the fact, can, what do you think the mRNA vaccine, the speeding up of it came from? How do you make for the fact that it was Donald Trump that didn't terror, work speed? Terror, so you, foolish panicking, just like we're doing with the climate issue. So you think Trump foolish was- panicking. Was he? Foolish panicking and politics. Listen, someone whispered in Trump's ear, you're going to be a champion and win the election. You got to move this vaccine forward. I think also partly that Trump really thought that he was doing something wonderful. He still does. I, I think that because that's what he said. <laughs> so it's understandable and rational to think that that's what Trump believes about the vaccine. I think that his intentions were fine. But the pushing of it, 
the demanding of it, the the mandating of it, the public shaming and outing of I know people who don't have careers anymore because of this, because of the vaccine. And this uh, question of, oh, so th uh, this is a perfect debate tactic, by the way, that you saw right at the beginning. That's why we're showing you this, because this is this is how a unfiltered conversation in America would go between a conservative and a liberal if it was allowed to happen in mainstream media. It doesn't. That's why we have our streaming platforms now where it can happen. But this is also how those conversations go at your Thanksgiving dinner table with your liberal brother-in-law or at the coffee machine in your office with the idiot down the hall with the cubicle with all the Bernie Sanders stickers on it. Because look at what they do to you. Look at the question that he asks. Do you, so do you think that any vaccines work? See? Oh, so, you did, so you're just anti-science. So you don't believe in any vaccines. You're trying to have a conversation about this very one extraordinary thing. Oh, so you don't like any vaccines. And Peterson makes an important point here. Not 80 of them for children. Now, I searched Destiny has one child, but I don't know if he's the primary caregiver for this kid. But let me tell you something. My youngest kid, my youngest kid is 17. I have four kids. And I went through the entire vaccine protocol. And by the way, full disclosure here, because I share as much as I can with you, that 17-year-old, my youngest child, he is on the autism spectrum. And, and at a time when so many people looked at vaccines and said, oh, vaccines are causing autism. I never walked down that road. And I still don't believe it. I know that many of you do believe it. Go with God. You'll be able to believe, you're able to believe whatever you want, okay? I witnessed with my own child. And I do not believe that the load of vaccines that children get contributed to autism. I tell you this only because I am the perfect candidate for this kind of thing, for vaccine skepticism. Because of what, because my own child falls into the category of children that so many activists against vaccinations would have me fall into. Okay. But I witnessed my children getting their vaccines, and I am told that it is even worse now. You know, seems like it wasn't that long ago, but the big rounds of vaccines that kids get are usually around a year and a half to two and a half years old. So that's 15 years ago for me, the last time I went through it. And you know what I'm talking about. You know what they do. <coughs> Excuse me. You're in the exam room with your pediatrician. The nurse comes in with like five syringes. And they give you a stack of paper. Written this big, double-sided, single-spaced, four columns with the precautions. They handed it to me the first time for my kids. I'm like, what is this? And they said, oh, these are this is all the information about the vaccines. And, and it's got all these side effects. It's got all these warnings. It got, it's got all these precautions and all these things that you're supposed to read through. As she's swabbing up my child's thigh to stick a syringe into. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait, I, I'm supposed to read all of this? Well, it's for your information. What do you mean it's for my information? Clearly, there are precautions here that I'm supposed to read about. It's a conveyor belt. It's like it's like a it's like a factory. And I'm not saying it's the nurse's fault. I'm not saying it's the doctor's fault. And I understand why they do it. But to suggest that everything is fine and that there's no, that, that you don't, how dare you even ask a question on behalf of your beautiful, innocent child is ridiculous and outrageous and a complete and total lie. But they're trying to box you into a corner of being an anti-science Neanderthal. But you see, you can't do it with Jordan Peterson. The man is literally a doctor and not a Jill Biden doctor. One other thing about my personal experience with vaccines, and then we'll get, we got a little bit more here. My oldest child has cerebral palsy. And we knew her cerebral palsy diagnosis when she was a year old. Okay. So by the time it was time for her to get the multiple vaccines from our pediatrician, um, we already knew that she had cerebral palsy. She was already going through certain levels of physical and occupational therapy. Uh, and at the time, we suspected what caused her delay, uh, her physical delay. But you know, cerebral palsy is a very inexact diagnosis. You know that there has been some damage to the brain. We had some idea of when it occurred, but we didn't know what caused it, right? And we only knew the physical manifestation from it. And we knew that the brain was functioning now. It happened like within the first hours of birth, okay? But um, so we knew that it was no longer functioning uh, improperly in the brain. We knew that the it was the basal ganglia uh, was 
perfectly fine. But we knew that damage had been done, but we didn't know what caused it. And because of that, the pediatrician voluntarily said, listen, it's time for the vaccinations and we're going to spread your vaccines out for, I'm not going to give her name, but my old, for my oldest daughter, who's 25 years old now and a dynamo and fantastic. And yes, she has cerebral palsy. She doesn't have full use of her right hand. She walks with a limp and she's incredible. But the pediatrician said, we are going to spread out the vaccines here because of her unique situation, because of the delays, because of her history. Think about that for a minute. Because we knew going in that, that something had gone wrong and that there was some sort of physical disability. The pediatrician voluntarily said, we're going to spread out the vaccines to be safe. Hey, I got an idea. How about we do that for all the kids? And I asked the pediatrician that. Listen, if this is a safety concern with the vaccines, why don't you spread them out for all kids? And do you know what the answer is? Well, because not all parents bring their kids in for their annual appointment. And so we got to make sure that they're vaccinated. So we load them up. We load them up. This is my experience. This is what my pediatrician told me. But I get you many, I bet you many of you hear the same thing. And I've asked doctors about it when I've interviewed them. That's exactly 100% what happens. Listen, there is more to this Jordan Peterson. Is We've already done over 30 minutes on this because it's so good. Uh, I commend you to go watch the entire thing. We appreciate the Daily Wire for doing this and for letting us have these clips for everybody to see here. Absolutely great work. And again, good on you, Destiny, for showing up. But you got you to gotta be better prepared, dude. You got to be better prepared with the notorious JP. Uh, millions of Americans earn and use credit card rewards, right? And our friends at handsoffmyrewards.com want to focus on what's going on in the Senate right now because your rewards, they're in danger right now. Corporate megastores want to take those rewards away. These are rewards that we use on groceries and school supplies, cash back to save on gas and grow small businesses, travel miles we use to make memories. The Durban Marshall credit card bill would eliminate credit card rewards. No more travel miles, no more cash back. When lawmakers help corporate megastores line their pockets, American families pay for it. Tell your senator right now to oppose the Durban Marshall credit card bill. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com to take action today. That's handsoffmyrewards.com. All right. Um, yesterday, Corinne Jean-Pierre agreed to do a uh, radio interview with a local station in Charlotte, North Carolina. Clearly, the campaign thinks that North Carolina is a uh, state that they need to fight for. But of course, she's the White House press secretary, so she wouldn't be appearing on this program for political or campaign purposes, right? <laughs> right. And the radio host asked a very reasonable question that literally everyone in America is thinking. Watch what happened when Corinne Jean-Pierre was faced with an uncomfortable question. When I told a number of people that I was talking to you today, it was interesting, though. They all said, would you please just ask her, does the president have dementia? And so before I move on from that, does he? Have that, Mark, Mark, I can't even believe you're asking me this question. That is a credibly offensive question to ask. But you know uh, people is, ask it. Wait, oh, let me, no, 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 no. You, Mark, you, 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 you took, you're taking us down this rabbit hole. Let me, uh, let me, uh, let me be very clear about this. Uh, for the past several years, the president's physician has laid out very, com in a comprehensive way, uh, the president's health. Uh, this is a president, if you watch him every day, if you really pay attention to his record and what he has done, you will see exactly how focused he's been on this, the American people, how historic his actions has been. And so I'm not even going to truly, truly, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, really, you know, take, take the premise of your question. I think it is uh, incredibly insulting. And, uh, and so we can, you know, we can move on to the next question. Yeah.
All right. So let's let's just pause there for a moment. This is, by the way, Mark Garrison is the radio host on WBT in Charlotte, North Carolina. And and, and he's not a this is not a conservative right wing talk radio station. This is pretty much all news all the time. They focus on local Charlotte issues. They don't have any syndicated radio hosts. And Mark Garrison is actually not just a a host. He's actually the news director at the station. So this is I assure you, she would have never agreed to this interview if it was somebody with a conservative perspective. And she never actually answered the question, did she? You know, there was a moment there when Mark Harrison was like, well, listen, people are saying this and people are asking this because, it, and, and before she could let him go through the reasons why this is a legitimate question, she said, no, 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 you brought it up. You brought us down this rabbit hole, so let me respond. But of course, she never really responded. What rabbit hole? It's not a rabbit hole. We see what the president does. We see how he behaves. What's going on there? Is he okay? Does he have dementia? It should be a really easy thing for her to say, of course not. But she didn't. She didn't. Instead, she acted, I'm offended. I reject the premise of the question. I'm not even going to answer it. I'm so offended. You offend me. It's offensive. Okay, but can you answer the question once you're done being offended? I won't dignify it with a response. Now, I just want to be clear here. The latest polling shows that over 80% of the American people think that Joe Biden has some kind of mental incapacity where it relates to doing his job as president of the United States. And Corinne Jean-Pierre, the spokesperson for the White House, responds to that giant majority in this country by saying they are all offensive. You're offensive for using common sense. You're offensive for voicing what everybody is thinking. You're offensive for being honest. That's how the left wins a debate. They don't engage in it. They just call you names. But good for Mark Garrison for not leaving it there. It continues. Prices and grocery prices, then. Big topics here in North Carolina. How does uh, Mr. Biden win votes when people don't have as much disposable income? Look, the president understands. Uh, he grew up in, in a middle-class family, a uh, working-class family in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He gets it. He understands how difficult it is for Americans who are sitting around their kitchen table every month trying to figure out what they're going to pay for. You have to. I am so sick of this, and I just want to interject here real fast. How, you want to talk offensive. Here's a guy saying, you know, we've got people living here in North Carolina who cannot pay their bills, who are paying double what they used to pay for groceries and gas. Does the president have any solutions to that? And the best she can come up with is, you know, he grew up in Scranton. And it wasn't easy back then in the 40s. The man has had a silver platter for every meal since the early 70s as a member of the United States Senate. Can we stop with the Scranton thing? Because it's been 50 years that he's been a senator or a vice president or now president. And by the way, in the four years between being vice president and president, Boy, the money was rolling in there from Ukraine and Russia and China and Kazakhstan. I mean, whatever's left that didn't go up Hunter Biden's nose. Oh, he gets it. You know, he grew up in Scranton. Did you know that? Did you know he grew up in Scranton? He gets it. It's uh, You talk about offensive. All right, uh, we'll let her answer go. Remember when the president walked into this administration, there were multiple crises happening. There was COVID. There was uh, the economy was in the tailspin because of the last administration, because of what the, the President Trump left us with. Now you're asking me about gas prices. The president took action on gas prices. Let's not forget Russia's invasion on Ukraine skyrocketed prices of gas. And because the president took action, we see we are in a different place than we were a year ago on gas prices. Uh, eggs, milk, uh, seafood products, uh, all the important uh, groceries, those costs have gone down because of what this president has been able to do. And th and with that, thank you so much, Mark. Have an amazing, amazing day. Wow. Wow. And she hung up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mark, Mark <laughs> this, this, you, listen, I am nominating you to get a press corps badge and you need to go to the White House. I'm sorry, but you asked 
three, four incredibly salient, important questions that are all front of mind. Nothing out of bounds. No baba booing or anything like that, right? And you did it exactly right on. And I don't understand. I don't understand the the fragility of this person. I mean, no. That's how it ended. And with that, Mark, goodbye. Click. And she hung up because they can't take any kind of challenges. They can't. I mean, this is a theme here, right? From Destiny and Jordan Peterson to now Green Jean Pierre, who's dared, you know, this radio host dares to ask a couple of questions that put her on her back heels. This is why uh, the left refuses to engage in debate and discussions in this country. And the arrogance, the pomposity of this woman. And let's not forget what set it all off, what started the whole thing was a question about Joe Biden's mental capacity, whether he has dementia, whether he's capable of fulfilling his duties as president of the United States for the rest of this year, let alone the four more years that he wants. And, you know, ever since a sitting U.S. attorney and special prosecutor said in a court filing that he wasn't going to bring criminal charges against Joe Biden, not because he didn't break the law, but because he has no memory and a jury will take pity on him because he can barely remember when his son died. Ever since that happened, I think it's a pretty relevant question for anyone to ask, a member of the media, but pretty much any American citizen. And what she just did to this radio host is exactly what she does to you every day for daring to think exactly what this radio host said. And let's face it, I mean, why would any of us think that Joe Biden has lost a step? Why would any of us think that Joe Biden has some sort of memory problem or mental incapacity or dementia for that matter? It's so offensive that you would ask such a thing. I mean, here he is yesterday talking about the bridge collapse in Baltimore. At about 1.30, container ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been over many, many times commuting from the state of Delaware to our trainer by car. Been in Baltimore Harbor many times. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you guys should be ashamed of yourself for thinking that that his brain is broken. The president mashed potato brains just said that he's been over the Francis Scott Key Bridge many, many times commuting home to Delaware on the train. Except for the fact that the Francis Scott Key Bridge doesn't have any train tracks on it. And it's not part of the Amtrak route to Delaware. I mean, other than that, he's got everything perfectly put together. How dare you? It's offensive. As usual, President Mashed Potato Brains is either a complete and total liar or he has no functioning brain left. Of course, we're always open to both. But here he is making his statement about the collapse of the train, and he has to make it about himself. Excuse me, the collapse of the bridge. And he has to make it about himself. Uh, I used to go over that bridge all the time on Amtrak. I guess we should be thankful that he didn't claim in this statement that his son, Bo, died in a bridge collapse. Although, I, if I let the video play a little further, maybe that's exactly what he did. Financial experts thought we were in the clear, right? They expected the interest rates to come down six times this year. They expected the Fed to bring down interest rates. That was the plan. That was the suspicion. That was the hope. But you know what hope gets you when you're planning economically in this environment with this president? The inflation data came out. It is higher than expected. The Fed just met. We'll be lucky to get three decreases this year. And we didn't get any in the first quarter. Now, listen, the U.S. is currently $34 trillion in the hole. And yet we keep printing money. They're going to start putting Joe Biden's name on a bill because it's all about him printing money out there to pop up, prop up this economy when it is unsustainable. This is pushing prices that you pay for everyday things even higher. You can either bury your head in the sand about what's going on, or you can actually do something about it and prepare for the inevitable. 
you should diversify a portion of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. That's what the folks at Birch Gold Group tell me. Gold is your hedge against inflation. Birch Gold makes it easy to own, too. They'll help you convert any existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. That's right. Your current IRA or 401k right now, whatever's in it, probably stocks, mutual funds, whatever, you can convert that fund, you can convert it into gold. And you won't have to pay a penny out of pocket. They've got an A-plus rating over the Better Business Bureau. They've got thousands of satisfied customers. You can trust Birch Gold too. Text Larry to 989898 right now to get your free info kit on gold. Then you'll talk to a precious metal specialist on how you can protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text Larry to 989898 right now. Yesterday, the Supreme Court heard arguments about the so-called abortion pill. Now, I say so-called abortion pill because it's actually not that simple. I think a lot of people, just like abortion 50 years ago, where people didn't really know the details of what went on in the procedure, they just knew the end result. And I think a lot of people willingly kept themselves ignorant about this because they didn't want to face the reality of what an abortion procedure really was and what really went on to the, the baby that was being destroyed. And it wasn't until pro-life activists actually started pushing this inconvenient truth on America on what the procedure was, what happened to that so-called clump of cells, as it was often described as. And certainly when the description of the procedure of partial birth abortion, late-term abortion was described, I mean, even Democrats, even Democrats like Joe Biden stood up and said that we have to ban that procedure. Well, I think that's exactly what we're experiencing right now with the so-called abortion pill, because the idea is, oh, you're pregnant, you take a pill, and it's over. And that's not at all the reality. And there are a group of doctors who are actually suing the FDA to try to put more precautions into this, but because they're seeing women who are suffering very dire consequences physically, men medically, because of this thing. And right now, they're not even keeping track of the records of this because they want to make it so easy for women to do this in the privacy of their own bedroom without a doctor and without a procedure. Just take the pill and everything will be over. It'll be over. Finally, it'll be over. Yeah, what's over? <laughs> we have to have these inconvenient conversations now. And yesterday, those arguments took place in the Supreme Court. And Caitlin Collins on CNN wanted to have a conversation about it. And I want you to know something about Caitlin Collins before you watch this video. Caitlin Collins' first job in journalism in Washington, D.C. was with the Daily Caller. Tucker Carlson and the team at the Daily Caller hired Caitlin Collins. And if you go back and look at the work she did at the Daily Caller, you would almost believe that she is a conservative. Caitlin Collins is now at CNN. Caitlin Collins now has a very different job. And Caitlin Collins came to this interview. Uh, the woman on your left is a, a gynecologist, a woman, an obstetrician gynecologist who is opposed to the, uh, she's one of the plaintiffs in this case. And on the right is the lawyer for Alliance Defending Freedom, a group that represents women of conscience on issues like this. And well, I want you to watch how this went because Caitlin Collins, she had a list of talking points that were fed to her by pro-abortion activist groups, or just the people who work at CNN. Same thing, really. And watch what happened when Caitlin Collins tried to present her arguments against people who know what the hell they're talking about. Just like visiting a doctor in person before you are essentially induced into labor in your dorm room, we're told that it's safe, that no one has the right to challenge the FDA. And this is the same FDA that told us that opioid safe was opioids were safe to use for chronic pain and that surely no one would get addicted. But is that a fair comparison given, you know, this drug is pretty safe. If you look at the, the actual facts here, it, it, the, the death rate is 0.0005% from someone who uses this drug and has complications. Penicillin is more dangerous than mifeprestone, and that's plenty used in the United States. That's, that's not being argued before the Supreme Court. 
Caitlin, that's actually not true in the sense of what the FDA's own statistic. No, it's not. What the FDA's own statistics and documents say are that up to 7% of women are going to have surgical interventions. In just 2000, or in just 2020, the FDA said that an in-person doctor visit is not only minimally burdensome on a patient, but it's necessary. And they explicitly said that thousands of women are presenting with severe complications as a result of taking this drug. This isn't me saying it. It's what the FDA has said. What they say in court now is very different than what their own data tells you. I mean, it's a widely used pill. It's quite safe. But but on the on the not even on that in and of itself, the question was whether or not they have the standing to, to bring this. And Dr. You know, Justice Amy Coney Barrett herself seemed especially skeptical of that. She pointed to to what you had submitted in particular, basically saying that you weren't able to show that that you had suffered the harm to actually bring this case, to have the legal standing to bring it. Do you still think that that she'll ultimately rule on your side in the end of this? Well, you know, I certainly hope that the justices will hear what we have presented, which is that um, those of us, again, who are on the front lines taking care of these women, um, women that have been abandoned by the FDA, women that have been abandoned by those who are giving the abortion drugs, who are not performing any kind of follow up. Those of us who are taking care of them are seeing the harms that women are experiencing. We are seeing it in droves as they come into our emergency rooms. And I hope that the justices heard that today and heard um, the harms that that's causing for us as well. And that really this was the FDA's responsibility to ensure that these high-risk drugs were dispensed in a safe manner. They recognized when they approved these drugs in 2000 that they were high-risk drugs and put into place very common sense safeguards, as Kristen said, were just simply asking for those common sense safeguards that provide ongoing medical care for women who are taking these high-risk drugs be reinstated so that women can receive the care that they deserve. I mean, the judges seem very skeptical of the evidence to back that up. We will see what they decide in July. Thank you, Dr. Christina Francis and Kristen Wagner for both being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, there's a little bit more of this interview that happened earlier that we're going to play for you, but um, uh, you saw the little mini debate there over how safe these drugs are. And she just kept reiterating, reiterating, Caitlin Collins did, that they're safe. Well, but they're safe. And of course, the lawyer then presented data and facts that shows that these are high risk drugs, actually. Let me tell you something. You remember when they didn't want you to take ivermectin? Remember when they said that, the, oh, it's horse dewormer. You're going to kill yourself if you take that. And yet I assure you that ivermectin is a lot safer for you than these very risky and dangerous so-called abortion pills. But you see, the abortion pills, the my for I'm not good with medical words, myopestrone? Mifepristone. Thank you, Kevin. Mifepristone. Um, the end result of taking this pill is that it terminates a pregnancy. It kills a baby. And it keeps women aborting babies. And because that's what the end result is, they will do whatever they can to ensure that it is widely available. I assure you, way more available than ivermectin ever was during the pandemic. Journalist and uh, broadcaster Amber Duke, formerly Amber Athey, took to the X platform and laid out some facts on this thing in commenting on Caitlin Collins' performance there. The FDA, and here's the thing, because they'll point to all these bullet points. They'll say, oh, but it's very safe. Look, there's hardly any instances of side effects with this drug. I wonder why. The FDA ended requirements for abortion pill providers to report any serious adverse effects related to mifepristone in 2016 five years before they decided to make the abortion pill available via mail order with no in-person doctor visit. In other words, under Barack Obama, as they were leaving power, the FDA ended requirements for doctors to report any kind of negative effects of this pill. Then five years later, they said, well, it looks like there's no negative effects. Let's make it available by mail order. They also used the pandemic to make it available via mail. Because, wow, well, you know, women can't go to their doctors and we can't have them having babies. So let's make it available in the mail. Well, are we sure it's safe? Because when we first agree approved this drug, there were a lot of serious side effects. No, look, we've been looking and it's been years since we had any negative data. Yeah, because in 2016, they stopped requiring doctors to report the negative data. 
Where was that on Caitlin Collins' fact sheet? Five years before they decided to make abortion, blah, 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 an in-person doctor visit. There is simply no available FDA data to indicate taking the abortion pill without a doctor's supervision is safe. But there are plenty of reasons to think that it's not, like ectopic pregnancies being a major example. In other words, if you have an ectopic pregnancy, if you have a pregnancy, you don't know that, by the way. If you find out, you, you go to the store, you get a pregnancy kit, it says that you're pregnant. You're desperate, you're scared, you want the abortion pill, you get the abortion pill without ever seeing a doctor. And it turns out you actually have a um, an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy in the where the where the unborn child is implanted into your fallopian tubes instead of in the uterine wall. If that's the case, you will have a catastrophic result from this pill. Why don't liberals care about that? Why don't they care about women? And what might happen to them? And again, these doctors who were in front of the Supreme Court yesterday aren't looking to ban the bill. All they're saying is these women should see a doctor first. They should have an examination before they kill the baby that's inside them. And apparently that's wrong. That's that's an anti-science position to say that you should see a doctor. Amber Duke goes on. Even when the FDA was collecting data, they did a very poor job of it. The point about opioids is important. The FDA has a history of undercounting serious side effects and convincing the public that drugs are safe. To repeat their claims wholesale without a rigorous look at the data is very poor journalism. But I'm not surprised given that most corporate media anchors these days are only good for reading the questions their producers put in the teleprompter and the facts prepared on their segment handouts. And if you think Amber or I are being too hard on Caitlin Collins, well, watch this exchange. When Caitlin Collins asks a question of the OBGYN here, assuming she knew the answer, and it turns out, well, it bites her right in the ass. But just to be clear, Dr. Francis, I mean, you have, have never had to go to the emergency room to do this. You've never been required to perform an abortion for, for someone who had complications from taking this, right? So I have actually taken care of women uh, in our emergency room who have come in with complications and, and had to do procedures to finish, um, you know, removing the contents of their pregnancy from their uterus. But, you know, again, it's the FDA's actions in removing these safeguards that would give an women an in-person right? visit. I have been brought down. Uh, we're going to watch this again, but I want you to watch something that happens here. Because Caitlin Collins is trying to make the point that, well, you, you've never had an emergency situation where you've had to have a woman come in and, and do an abortion because of complications from the pill. And what the woman is saying, what this doctor is saying, but she's too decent to actually say it out loud, is that, well, the pill killed the baby, but it was such a painful mess inside the, the patient that she had to come into the emergency room and I had to clean out what was left of the baby that has just been killed. That's what she's saying. Now, I want you to watch Caitlin Collins here because her hair looks fabulous, okay? And I'll give her that, honestly. I always want to say something nice about people. And her hair looks fantastic. But if you can look at how her hair is right now, it is purposely styled in such a way where you cannot see her ears. This is a trick that women do on television because who wants to see the communications device that's in your ear that the producer is using to talk to you during an interview? And clearly she asked this question because she thought she asked it in such a way where she thought she knew the answer. Uh, this woman was probably asked, have you ever had to do, perform a, an abortion on a woman after they've taken the pill? And the answer was no. Technically, that's not true. It wasn't an abortion. And so now the producer jumps into Caitlin Collins' ears and tells her, oh, no, no, no. OK, but what she's talking about is not an abortion. So then Caitlin Collins has to like jump in there and say, OK, oh, sure, you had to do some sort of medical procedure, but it wasn't an abortion. Watch how this transpires with Caitlin Collins here. It's such an obvious thing that's happening. Taking this, right? So I have actually taken care of women uh, in our emergency room 
who have come in with complications and and had to do procedures to finish, um, you know, removing the contents of their pregnancy from their uterus. But you know, again, it's the FDA's actions in removing these safeguards that would give women an in person right? visit. <laughs> I have been brought down to the emergency room to complete the process that was started by these abortion drugs, and. Again, this is happening more and more frequently because women are not even receiving in-person medical care prior to receiving these high-risk drugs because of the FDA's decisions. Yeah, you saw it, right? You saw it. I saw it. We all saw it. That was a failed attempt at a gotcha moment, a killer gotcha moment. She was going to go viral with that. You haven't even had to deal with this. And yeah, here you are arguing in front of the Supreme Court. It's going viral, but not for the reasons that Caitlin Collins wanted. But again, the hair looks fabulous, Caitlin. Keep up the great work there. You must be very proud. I'm sure your parents are. The reason that we talk about this, the reason that I'm bringing this to your attention is that, listen, in a post-Roe v. Wade world, I think we've all realized that no matter what the Supreme Court says, no matter what your elected officials say, no matter what the Supreme Court says in June about the arguments that they just heard yesterday, we have to make a compelling argument to try to change the culture in this country away from thinking that babies are disposable and recognizing and embracing the fact that the babies deserve to live. And that when they are killed in this manner, a little part of our entire culture is killed. And over here on this program, on this platform, we care about women. We care about what women go through with the so-called abortion pill, physically as well as psychologically, emotionally, and mentally. Our friend Mary Margaret Olihan, senior reporter over the Daily Signal, was in front of the Supreme Court yesterday talking to the protesters and the counter-protesters, and she found a woman who has had a personal experience with this drug. They will tell you, the left will tell you, Planned Parenthood will tell you, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and the Democrats will tell you, that this is a very sterile experience. You just, you're pregnant. You don't want to have to deal with going to an abortion clinic, or maybe you live in one of those crazy right-wing red states where you don't have easy access to an abortion clinic to kill that baby. That's fine. You just go on the internet, you fill out a form, you click a button, give them money. Oh, don't forget that part. And you'll get a pill in the mail, follow the instructions. It's just like having a period. It'll all be over. Well, that's what they'll tell you. Here's what they won't tell you. And here's what they don't want you to know. The abortion drug was not safe and it wasn't easy like they told me it was going to be. They said it was going to be like a double period and that just wasn't true. I'm here because in 2010, I was prescribed the abortion drugs and I was not prepared for how severe and devastating those, those drugs were going to be. And I found myself on the bathroom floor covered in a pool of blood, wondering if I was going to survive the procedure completely alone until I reached down and lifted out of my body the perfectly formed transparent sac with a recognizable baby inside. And it was so incredibly traumatic. I suffered horrific side effects, not only physical, in the moment of the procedure, but to this day I still suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and it's something that has followed me since that day. Wow. Now, when you were prescribed these abortion drugs, can you tell us about that experience? How easy was it to get them and um, how how uh, quick was the process? Well, it, it was easy to get them, but I did not receive adequate care. I wasn't given informed consent. I was not given um, adequate follow-up care. Um, they tried to conceal the uh, ultrasound from me until I asked specifically if I could see that. There was a lot of coercion and manipulation involved in receiving this drug. Uh, but the most important thing is that the abortion drug was not safe and it wasn't easy like they told me it was going to be. They said it was going to be like a double period and that just wasn't true. It wasn't true at all. It was very severe and traumatic and very powerful. So how far along were you? I was between six and seven weeks pregnant. And they told you that this would be very simple. It would be like two double periods at the same time? Yeah, they told me it was going to be like a double period. I might feel some cramping, see a little bit of clotting. No one told me that I would hold my child in my hands and would need to decide what to do with that body. I ultimately flushed him down the toilet into the septic tank. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that moment was like when you reached down and found, held the amniotic sac and realized that you were holding your child? 
no one prepared me that this was even a reality or, or a possibility. Um, so when I held my child, I realized what I had done. And in that moment, the trauma was so severe that now, 14 years later, I relive that moment. I relive the moment of holding that baby covered in blood, terrified, wondering if I'm going to survive, hoping and wishing that I would be able to get out of that situation. Nobody's there to help me. I was completely alone. No American woman, no woman on the planet deserves to do that or to go through that alone. It's, it's despicable. And that was 14 years ago. Do you think that 14 years ago when restrictions were more a little tighter on how you could gain access to these drugs. Now, in 2024, do you think women are going through the same ease of access that you were? Well, you're right. There were restrictions in place when I received my abortion, and even still, I did not receive the care that I was legally entitled to, such as follow-up care or a follow-up doctor's visit or a follow-up ultrasound. So imagine now, with no restrictions in place, what is a woman going to experience without any of that care? I cannot imagine how terrifying that must be for women and how many women are finding themselves in that same place on the bathroom floor covered in blood wondering if they're going to die. Now, can you share with us, Elizabeth, have you had any mental or physical side effects of that chemical abortion 14 years ago? Unfortunately, yes. I suffered from an eating disorder. I do have post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depression. The side effects are very, very deep and far-reaching, and it's something that I had to find um, professional counseling to help me get through, and, and I'm still dealing with it. So this isn't something that's safe like a Tylenol. This is something that will follow women for the rest of their lives. Now, what do pro-abortion advocates say to you when you share your story? I've heard lots of things, right? But the, the, main, the main point is that no matter what they say and no matter what their reaction is, the truth is the truth. And this drug was devastating and it nearly killed me and it, and it hurt me. So whatever their reaction, I'm here to tell the truth. All right. And then why are you here today at the United States Supreme Court? I'm here today at the U.S. Supreme Court because I want the FDA to do its job. I want them to keep women safe. That's what they're here for, and they're being negligent, and they need to be held accountable for what they did to me and what they do to women everywhere. Uh, for many Christians, this is Holy Week. Tomorrow's going to be Holy Thursday, the uh, acknowledgement and celebration of the Last Supper. Uh, Friday is Good Friday, and then Sunday we uh, celebrate pretty important moment in world history with the resurrection on Easter Sunday. It's a good time to say some prayers about where we are right now and where we're headed. That's it for today. We'll be back next time. Thank you so much for watching. Please do like, subscribe, and share. Uh, copying a link to the video that you're watching now uh, and putting it on your social media page uh, and putting it out there, it does a lot for us, and we really appreciate it when you do. I'll see you in the comments section a little later, and I'll be responding to whatever it is you said today. I always love seeing them, and uh, we'll be back next time. Thanks for watching. My name is Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. <laughs>